All right. Let's go ahead and open in prayer. Heavenly Father, your blessing on this study today as we dig into the first couple of chapters of the letter to Hebrews. Um, enlighten us, open our hearts and our minds to receive your word, and may it edify us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, folks. Well, I'm I'm filling in, obviously, for, uh, uh, for Todd, and... Um, uh, today we're going to be taking, we're going to continue the the look at uh, chapter one and chapter two of, of Hebrews. Uh, so, for starters, would uh, would someone please read for us chapter one verses four through fourteen? Yeah. All right. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father? Or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, He makes his angels wind, his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and your righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, in the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hand. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment they will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool, footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Thank you. You're welcome. Thoughts? Well, it appears that the author here is taking great pains to um, contrast Jesus with the angels and make the point that he's elevated. Why do you suppose that is? I mean, he could have just said, he could have left it at uh, verse four. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. But then he continues on, cites scripture, and, and really drives home this point. Angels must have been a big deal in Jewish thought or culture or something. And maybe there was a tendency to almost equate them with divinity, or I don't know if they worship angels or not. But... How do you know? Well, there's a, what I read. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's all right. It's not all right. Um, what I read both in my study and, and my study Bible and in uh, Barclay was that obviously, you know, from the time of Moses, you know, the Old Testament ca captures and documents the relationship of God with the Jewish people. But at the time of the New Testament, some 2000 years ago, there was kind of a zeitgeist shift that was heading in the direction of uh, the 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 divinity of God and the separate separation of God from the people. People thought, well, you know, it would have been impossible. You know, they began to believe things like it would have been impossible for Moses to have seen God because he would have combusted. You know, no one could survive that, uh, and uh, and so that it became common belief that the angels were basically the intermediaries uh, between humanity and and the divine god and um and here he's saying hold on <laughs> you know you need to be schooled on this and so i think that's why he he did take such pains because again this is a letter to the 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 hebrew christian church people who had a very deep rooted theology in 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 the jewish religion now converted and worshiping the risen Christ, 
and still succumbing to sort of their their cultural understandings of the time. So, um, so uh, uh, I think the one thing that I, I there's a quote from Barclay that I think is very helpful here in understanding and kind of driving home the the critical importance here. Um, we need no man or super, in fact, I'm going to read it out of the book. It's better context. That was page 20, I think it was. The writer to, Hebrew, to the Hebrews lays down the great truth that we need no man or supernatural being to bring us into the presence of God. Jesus Christ has broken every barrier down and opened a direct way for us to God. So how do you think the, the Jews felt about that concept? Well, it was a big deal. It was new and quite a quite a shift from the Old Testament. Perhaps controversial. <clears throat> okay. Other thoughts? In a way, with the obvious mediator, like the priest would be, I guess, although he was a little on later, I think we talked about Jesus, the high priest. I mean, he has a mediator function, but I mean, he's kind of a complete mediator, a perfect mediator. I just have to say this because it has, it's not even inspirational, but it's just interesting to me. I was reading somewhere that in the first four verses, there are four phrases that describe Jesus here or excuse me, seven phrases. And then there are seven Old Testament references that follow that. It's some sort of structural thing, I guess. Oh, in sevens? You seen that, yeah, the series of seven. So there are seven quotes from the Old Testament that sort of support each one of the claims, I guess, <laughs> that were made in the, the, the prologue there. It just... I mean, because people seem sort of mixed up and crazy and goes all over the place for my linear thinking sort of brain. But this sort of just helps me realize, oh, there's kind of purpose behind all this. If you can get into the mind of the author or something. Well, the mind of the author and perhaps the mind of the target audience, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, you know, Todd would say, we're the audience. And that's great. But part of this, kind of the fun of this, I guess, is dissecting who the immediate audience was at the time. Yeah. You know, they would have likely recognized and appreciated the the pattern of sevens, I would think. Yeah. Totally missed that. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I don't know that there's much more. Does anybody have anything that stands out to them from these words? No? Well, we've got enough here to, to dive through. So um uh can we can someone please read for us chapter two verses one through four? I can do that. Okay. There, therefore, we must pay greater attention to those who heard so we do not hear clearly. For if the message declared through angels of God every time the best of the to receive this penalty. And how can we escape it from angels? Neglect so great salvation. It was third, third and first of the Lord and it was attached to us by her. Now, O oh God, I have this testimony by sight of wonder and verse, no verse, a gift of the Holy Spirit, the story of your queen to as well. Is that one through four? Yes. That's one through four. Thoughts? Wake, wake up. Listen, listen yeah. This, right? yeah so wake, it's a wake up call. Yeah. It's a wake up call. Right. Yeah. And so, what is he comparing there? Um, it seems to be two um, revelations, if you will. What are they? Well, there's a great salvation. Right. right. That's. Don't drift away. 
And I want to circle back to that because I found that a very interesting choice of words. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, for since the message spoken, what does he mean uh, for uh, since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received, it's just punishment? What is he referring there? This is tricky because it circled back to what we had just talked about, the, the current understanding of, of, uh, of the Jews of this, day, of this era. They didn't think that the Ten Commandments or the commandments came directly from God to Moses. They thought that the angels delivered it because humans could not stand to be in proximity to God. And so they're basically referring to the law. So this revelation provided by God through the angels uh, of the law, you know, that was a great thing. But now we have this revelation of salvation. You know, the law condemned. Salvation forgives. And the so we... was binding then. Yeah. That was a big deal. Then how much more then is this message important to us or binding on us or compelling for us is that kind of the point i think so yeah that's that's sort of what the text seemed to indicate um pay attention, pay attention. well what does that mean well i think i think it means there's a, like you're saying this this is a big change <clears throat> so you have to yeah you got you have to Put your old mind behind you and have a new mind, have a new mind, a new perspective, right? And change is hard. Yeah. yeah. Especially after all these years. <laughs> and the law was the thing. Yeah. Was... Yeah. And, yeah. And when it's fresh and new in the church, you know, we're, we're down the road a few decades here from the time of Christ. We're dealing with the second generation in many cases. And um, uh, with some overlap, it's still fresh, but it's been around a while. Why would he say then, you know, let's make sure we don't drift away? You know, uh, it, it almost seems that what was going on in the in the in the in the Hebrew church was, um, you know, they were probably trying to start to slip a little. It's like back to you know? further to former sort of right, yeah. It goes, don't do that. <laughs> this is still a very critical thing. And they would have valued highly the the um you know the significance of the law. That was one of their gifts. It was given to them, so they would identify pretty strongly with that, wouldn't they? Yeah. So why did he use drift? It's easy to get away from something slowly. Sometimes it's easy to embrace something quickly and then wait a minute. I think drifting. We all do that. I mean, we get excited about something and then the excitement fades. Well, and drifting, they were many of them lived in water and were fishermen. They knew what drifting, they could relate to what drifting, ha what happens when you drift. Right. You can get lost forever. Right. Or Yeah, it's a metaphor for a spiritual condition. Yeah. yeah. When you're moving, sometimes you don't really know it when you're drifting. Sometimes you don't even realize that you're moving much. Yeah. Next thing you know, where am I? Yeah. I'm on the rocks. Yeah. Or not where I thought I was. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I know in my experience i ebb and flow that's what i like to call it. and i suppose you could apply the word drift there are times where i'm a little more solid a little more attuned to what i perceive i should be and then there are times where i know darn well i'm not and i would consider that a drift and it strikes me um the challenge or the the risk uh, if you will of falling away uh, that Christians, I suppose it's one of our greatest risks. And I suspect that it doesn't 
happen as a deliberate cognitive act. Oh, well, I'm done with this. No. Um, I think it's it's acts of convenience. It's acts of incremental change that if we're not attuned, if we're not alert, we could become susceptible to um, acts of convenience. You know, how we look at things. I mean, we've all seen the church through time kind of take changes in, in course of action. Um, I might refer to why we would be so silent during World War II, you know, in, in Europe. Um, probably because they were afraid for their lives, but it also meant that they perhaps weren't fulfilling their role. Um, and I'm, there are other times where it just kind of drifts. <laughs> and I found that word to be, uh, it, it spoke to me anyway, and I thought that's something to, to key in on. And I think in this case, that was probably what was going on. There was probably a desire to merge, you know, you have this, the, the faith is still new, and you had a formal way of looking at life that is fully indoctrinated in you. And there might have been a tendency to kind of incorporate the familiar. But in doing so, you risk losing the gem that you have. And I think that's what the author's trying to say here. There's also a culture within Judaism of differing opinions and schools of thought. And so that there's that like tenuous balance between different aspects of faith being expressed in those and also then taking a step too far and becoming an isolated thing that is not really the truth anymore you know and so just culturally there would have been and I don't even know if it's just culturally because I think we as people all find little niches that we like to find ourselves in our little you know en enclaves that just say we're just going to stay here with the people that we think I don't know if there's a lot of in-group out-group but um but there's a piece of that as well. I mean, like there were just people who had, you know, very different differences in their beliefs within Judaism too. And a lot of it's in here, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, a diverse picture. So. And don't we have that too? Oh yeah. I mean, we as Americans cling to our freedom and freedom of thought. And we have a, a whole array of different denominations supposedly praising the same God and the same risen Christ taking slightly different viewpoints and maybe that isn't so bad but is there it you know could it be that there's a risk that what we don't want to do is lose the most important aspects thoughts i'm just thinking about the word drift now and got me thinking about um but you know as as you get older like most of us are and you'll come back and you, of course, you move once, but you have friends you make over the years, and then they drift, drift away because you're not engaged with them, because they're you're they're not part of your life anymore. And then, if you think about that, that's kind of the way it happens with faith too. If it's not part of your life anymore, it's not something you're focused on, it's not something you stay in touch with, you know. And it's not that your friends are gone; you're just not connected anymore, you know. Or, yeah. You know, so. Yeah. I think there's also the sort of the drift of like the the layers that we put on things too, you know, in terms of uh, whether that's maybe like in like in biblical interpretation or something like that, or um, you know, maybe mythologies that we have. Um, yeah. You know, we we talk about you know we, we can look back at our constitution, for instance, and and you know ignore the fact that right there it talks about you know black people being three fifths you know, mm -hmm. person, right? It's, in, it's enshrined right there, you know, and, and that's one of those, one of those things that we just kind of like, kind of gloss over. And I think in, in the same, same fashion with, you know, um, sorry, this is coming off of, I just, just finished the, uh, the Mars Hill podcast. <laughs> like, um, how many of you are familiar with Mars Hill, the, the church? That really wasn't either. I wasn't, I didn't even kind of grow up in that, that, that circle or whatever, but it was this huge mega church started in Seattle back in the 90s, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, it grew- big in the early 2000s. It was when it was really like in its heyday. Yeah, and it it, uh, it it grew to like, I can't remember how many 50 campuses and you know thousands of members and everything and just kind of overnight just imploded. And, um, 
anyway, it so it talks about the different kind of the the sort of abuses of power and and the you know just unhealthy culture within the like the leadership and the and the church and stuff. Um, but my my point being back to that kind of that that drift or whatever you know that that uh, uh, there are times when we have to take a, take a look and, and realize that maybe we have different assumptions and things that we put on you know on stuff. Right. So you know false teachings or whatever you know whatever it might be things that we confuse uh, for faith. And there's a lot of things that can can fill that role. So maybe we think about this as a risk. And how do we apply risk management to the the potential risk of drift? And you know, um, how do we prevent it in our lives in our church? So it's not just about being more intentional. If drift is sort of the opposite of intentionality, it's kind mm -hmm. of what we intend on, or what to what do we give our attention? You know, because we can give it to a false sort of thing. To, so, you know, he's telling us that we basically realize who Jesus is here, you know, isn't, it, isn't that kind of his point? Yeah. Well, and one way of, of not drifting away is like attending this class. Staying engaged. Mm -hmm. yeah. Staying engaged. And and maybe well, keeping well, others yeah. in check. <laughs> well, you know? so I was going to say, that's, that's the thing. I mean, I have... I have cultivated some of my social media friends from my past experience in life that I do not in any way, shape, or form agree within the spectrum of faith then anymore because they have they're on a very different plane than I am in a lot of things. But I keep them there, even though my first gut reaction whenever I read something from them is to just sigh and throw my hands up in the air. Just to, to to keep myself so I know where I'm at and I can see all the pieces because I think sometimes when we put ourselves in a corner somewhere and we don't realize what else is out there, sometimes there are value in things that are outside our circle. And sometimes it's yes. good to be reminded of why we're not in that part of the circle as well. Mm -hmm. um, and every time I get frustrated with it, um, Paul has said to me multiple times, Sarah, you were there once too and God brought you somewhere else. So you know, we just keep praying that people who haven't, who, who are in a place where maybe they shouldn't be, that, and not that you're doing this to say I'm right, but just that you hope that God brings them to a place where they can be fruitful for their flocks and not harmful for their flocks, which is something that kind of breaks my heart a little bit. You know, I, when I was reading this, I thought of a metaphor. Um, I do archery. And when you're aiming in archery, it's, you're not holding steady on one point. Your, your sight window floats. And the key is to train your body to keep that thing focused on what's important. Otherwise, if you try to focus and you try to time your shot, eventually it's just going to veer off. It's to get it relatively on the target and let the shot just happen without thinking about it. Um, and in this case, I don't think, I think drift is part of it, considering new ideas, bringing people in. What's your perspective on this? But at the end of the day, when we get together, one of the things I like about this is, number one, we're relying on the Bible to tell us. So we're, re re we're relying on a standard that God set. The beauty is we drift. God does not. And so it, he's the solid rock. And our task of trying to understand it is superhuman. It's beyond us, I believe. But the important stuff isn't. And that I think, the, if faith, that's, that's faith, isn't it? We want proof. We want concrete evidence. And we can't get that out of this. At the end of the day, we have to approach this with a, with a degree of faith. And I think that's by design. I think that's what God intends for us. Otherwise, um, PhDs would be going to heaven and the rest of us would be, you know, that would be a problem. You'd, you'd be in the lucky group. <laughs> You're still in the lucky group. But but anyway, that I I deviated on that. But I, um, I think it's, um, I think what's expressed here for us in our takeaway, and please speak to this if you feel compelled, 
is that we should remain mindful of what the important thing is, you know, what's critical to our faith. And I don't think there's any reason uh, preventing us from exploring as long as we keep the core, um, the core value of our faith in mind and work with one another in checking it. So well, the truth is that God is a disappointing thing. God has revealed a lot of different faiths in many facets. And that doesn't mean God has changed. It just means our maybe our perception is kind of mm -hmm. a little bit bigger. Um, yeah. But that can be kind of scary too. It's like, what? Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think of them as a diamond, that you can only see so many faces of that diamond at any one time. Your brain can only comprehend it um, because, you know, created DNA. He created the universe, a thing that's still expanding. You know, I mean, how do we get our brain across that? You can't. And, and so within the, within the scope of our limitation, we 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 bridge the we bridge the majority of it with faith. That's the little circle you try to get the arrow in. You're talking about. I think so. <laughs> Other ideas? I see it as a rich topic, and <laughs> you know, I think it's it's. Yeah, I, I think one other piece. I just um, like the. Uh, and oftentimes we talk about, you know, like drifting, kind of getting back to our kind of our roots, you know, right? And and I, I wonder if what what we I don't know how to how to express it exactly. Sometimes I think of it theologically, you know, that people talk about getting back to their roots and they think like I can just go back to the, you know, like the faith that I had in, you know, high school or something where everything was so crystal clear, you know, kind of like in the, you know, Psalm one or something like that. And, and I think developmentally, that's part of where we are in human development. And that's why everything's so crystal clear in, in a way that, that changes as you get older. And so a lot of times people say, which well, we is, you know, we just need to get back and, and, and you can appeal to somebody's like sort of that mindset. Nostalgia. And, yeah. And um, simple faith. Right. And that's and to me, that's not getting back to, to the roots. It, it's the exploration, I think, is through um, I'm on this in the space, I guess, right now, of like I'm just hearing from different voices because the many facets of God, like you're talking about, <clears throat> you know, if I just talk to, you know, if I just talk to middle aged white men <clears throat> about God. I'm, I'm you know. God is going to look a lot like a middle-aged white guy. And you know? pretty much a boring group, I would have to say. <laughs> and and so uh, I, you know, I was uh, at, at our Presbyterian press meeting and um, at, at dinner was sitting with uh, uh, the director of our, uh, or it's Camel Farm in um, uh, outside of Yakima. And um, she's, uh, she's, Native American, and she was a friend of hers, also Native, and they do a lot of these amazing things for the community out of this this farm. And we were chatting, and I was telling her about some of these revelations I'm I'm getting about. Uh, we're talking about Abraham Lincoln and stuff, and, um, and I'm like, man, I did not know this stuff. And I'm talking to them like, you know, like I'm telling them these discoveries about how you know Lincoln, you know, it's more complicated, and the how he treated or uh, or maybe did not take opportunities to act on behalf of Native Americans. Um, you know, I was like, oh, I did not know this. And and they're kind of, you know, very polite and everything, but they're like, yeah, we, this is part, we know this history, you know, and we don't know that until we, we have that, those interactions and see those different facets of, you know, of our world. Um, so. Yeah. So if we just recline into our little comfort zone, we don't grow. Right. And well, our faith doesn't grow, right? And and you know, you think about the different circles of the times when when um, or even even now, you know, like a native uh, a native woman, indigenous woman, is not heard. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And mm -hmm. and so in in certain you know white middle aged <laughs> uh, you know male settings, I mean, women aren't heard. You know. Yeah. Um, and and so anyway, 
sorry, a little soapbox there, but I just read this morning in the Catholic Church that wouldn't burn its standard role, wouldn't it? Wow, we can help them with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's where it, a good church there. It, it becomes hard because it's not concrete. And I get it because I came from a place where we was I was raised in concrete and it was very comfortable because I'm type A and I like concrete. But the word of God is evolving. And it's not that that means God changes. It just means that his way of speaking to us changes because we're changing. And that's not bad. And that's not, you know, hypocritical. And it's not, uh, you know, I, I just, I don't know. It's, it's a challenge for some people to grasp. But I think, and like you said, when you're going back to these roots, where it's like, nope, it's simple. This is all it is. And it's like, it's not simple. And that doesn't no. mean we give up. It just means that there's a lot of uh, beauty to explore there and some challenging things to explore there. Um, but uh, yeah, I think people, I, I don't know. It, it's just easy to make it very simple. And, it, and it's not. No, no. And you're right. You're right. It isn't, it isn't simple at the end of the day. Uh, we can rely on core principles. It's like, well, you take 600 some odd laws. What's the most important? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. A closely related one. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's simple. But and keeping, complex. and so that that's how you keep the keel straight. As by keeping in mind the, the core principle. And, and the rest, I think, is about living life, which I think we are to do, right? You have given me an image I will take to the grave. <laughs> I was raised in concrete. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Think about how you get rid of concrete. <laughs> Well, and, and, and again, it's that when you're raised in that world and then you come to kind of where we are in our journey right now, like we are now the people that don't have real faith, right? We're the ones that have adapted to make ourselves adaptable to culture and, you know, um, have strayed. I mean, that's what we're viewed as, right? Sure. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. just, um, I don't know, it's, it, it was really a lot of unpacking mentally, still unpacking. You keep coming up with things where you're like, oh, that is the old brain, shut the old brain off, because it's really hard not to, to go back to that. You think that's how God views us? Old brains? Old brains? Old no, no. <laughs> um, I, 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 it's a, it borders on a derogatory statement, but a question, but uh, how does God view us? You know, if we, if we take on new things and try to, you know, um, change. change, adapt. I mean, part of this is adaptive management, right? It's, it's, it's how are we, how are we engaging in a world uh, in an effective way, maintaining and professing our faith. Growth. It's, it's not. It's called growth. Right. Your faith is growing. And I guess what came to my mind is that the opinions of others is no business of mine except the opinion of God. Right. And I and I still struggle with that because I know that <laughs> I'm. I don't know if I want to know the answer to that. I think I'm gets, afraid of it. I think he gets super excited when we get to those points where he's like, now you see it how I see it. I think he gets super excited, you know, because there are times I'm sure that like he's been putting little things in our heads and yeah. like, here, follow this breadcrumb trail, please. <laughs> and, and so, hello, <laughs> but, but not in a, you know, not in a demeaning way, but like, yeah. in a, I'm excited because my creation is getting it right. I think, I think he's, I think he gets excited. That's wonderful. Okay, let's um, let's get to uh, um, can someone read for us verses five through nine of chapter two? Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere. What are human beings that you are mindful of them? Or mortals that you care for them, you have made them a little, a little. Uh, you've made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with the glory, or with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. How far am I reading? Uh, to nine. nine. To nine. Okay. Uh, now, in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, 
We do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, <laughs> now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. What's he saying here? Like first Jesus being elevated, so that you can say Jesus was made a little bit lighter, made by us, but it also to get this kind of two, two aspects here. So, you know, Jesus divine in the first part, and Jesus is human in the second part here. And that what's going on here. Well, um I don't know if I should caveat it, but I'll just float this by you guys because I did do you know a lot of reading on this part and it seemed to be difficult to fully understand but it appears the context of this is actually speaking about humans and how humans were intended and created to be just below the angels and yet we kind of fumble the ball in the part where he says um, yet at present we do not see everything subject to them to people that somehow we've we faltered through the act of sin, we kind of drop ourselves down. It's it's not a good look on us. Um, but then, uh, but then, then it refers to Jesus, who made uh, who was made lower than angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So. You know, the 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 cosmic dilemma humans face. We have fallen from grace. We have sinned, and and he gave us the law that we couldn't measure up to. And even through sacrifice, it just was a never-ending cycle. And it was like trying to reach the surface of the water, you never quite make it to get a breath. And here comes Jesus, perfect, made human, made lower than the angels subjugated learned our, our 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 situation was able to empathize with us and, and understand where we are and then suffered on our behalf and paid our sin by, by the way that's a, a that references psalm 8 the quote in there about the angels being lower and so on yeah right What else speaks to you in this? Strikes me as a lot of responsibility. Now in subjecting all things to them, God's left nothing outside their control. That's not like I'm in the sky and I'm just moving things around and you all are just my little puppets, but like, here you go. <laughs> Deal with it and figure it out. <laughs> I mean, it's, and did he not, a lot on our plate. Well, he did. And didn't he, and I don't have the passage, but didn't he give us dominion over the, the animals and the plants and the earth and the waters and everything in it? Sure. I just think we like to point at God and blame God a lot. But this pretty squarely puts things under our jurisdiction. Yeah, what 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 have we done with that responsibility? Screwed it up a lot. <laughs> it's a loaded question. I probably shouldn't have raised that. <laughs> um, but it does, it does, you know, and we we reap the consequences of our actions too. Well, if we are responsible. We're not perfect. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I might say we there was a point at which we were before we were with sin. We were what we were supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But with sin, we're not. And we make choices as a result of that sin that miss the mark. So that psalm passage is in reference to humanity, not to Jesus. Is that what you're saying? 
Well, what is, uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll read my version here. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? A son of man. Oh, and the reference here using the term son of man in Hebrew, we have the Christian take, which meant, go, meant Christ. Mm -hmm. But here, uh, the Hebrew original meaning is just human. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, a son of man that you care for him. You made them a little lower than the angels. Uh, you crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. So he's really specifically referring to humans. You created them. You gave them the Garden of Eden. You said you will have dominion over this. This is your this is your place. And, and it's a good thing. And all was good. And yet, and then he says, and in putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. So he's really saying. You, you know, we humans, we were created with a really, a very prestigious position in reality. Wow. And yet, at present, we do not see everything subject to them. In other words, there's a failure, there's a derailment of that intended purpose. Can I, can I speak Please. from the uh, far outfield somewhere, <laughs> from the bleacher section? I guess. Um, I, I guess the question I have is, yeah, I, I agree with everything you're saying there. Does that mean that everything we do now is bad? Can we, in fact, make good good choices? Sure. Yes, we were created in the image of God and have his fingerprint on us. And he reveals himself more to us to make him us more like him. So yeah. So even though, even though we do blow it, there's no question about that. There's also times when we don't blow it, <laughs> when we, we do things correctly, <laughs> and whether we're Christian or not, we do things correctly. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, that's so it's just important to be able to distinguish that yes we do make mistakes and we have made mistakes and we continue to make mistakes but not always <laughs> and that right it doesn't well, mean it does it doesn't mean we're evil it just means we're flawed and maybe we learn from our mistakes <laughs> yeah yeah hopefully so <laughs> yeah okay I'm going off. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. So it's maybe the word aid that we have agency because it gives us the leeway to be both, right? Yeah. And that's the whole point here. It's just that we have we have in some ways power over our own situations. Yeah. And when you think about what like happened with Adam and Eve, you know, our role hasn't really changed. Um, the circumstances have. You know, we now have to live with sin, and that's a drag. Um, it, it's not perfect. It's not a Psalm 1 world. It's now a very complicated world. And and uh, we have to take responsibility for that. Um, true responsibility, though, would be death. Yeah, we're granted salvation. We're granted the gift of Christ, the gift of grace. And that gives us that gives us the out. That gives us the ability to regroup and and reevaluate. And if we keep our core focus, you know, it, it it can color our world. We can be a positive influence in a stance that not everything we do is bad and shouldn't be thought that way. Because if I thought that was the case, why would I even be here? You know, just hang out. Well, it's also an imperative to do good, I think. Yeah. Because it's not like we're just sitting back and being like, well, God's the only one that can do anything anyway. I mean, basically saying that we have power to make good decisions and a charge to do so. Like, we don't just sit around and wait for something good to happen. Although yeah. there are people who do that. Oh, I know. <laughs> let's, uh, we, we've got opportunity to actually finish this. So let's, let's move on. Will someone please read? Uh, verse 10 through 18 of chapter 2. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, 
in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here I am and the children, and here am I and the children whom God has given me. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who, ha who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to become, become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be merciful and faithful, be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself was tested by what he suffered. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. A little right. <laughs> Yeah, just a little light reading, huh? It is a lot. There's, there seems to be a pretty strong reference to family in this. You know, um, Jesus basically claiming us as brothers and sisters. What, what's the significance of that? Well, he's claiming us now. This passage comes in the psalm that didn't get never caught that before, but that's referring to us. He's claiming us who screwed everything up as his brothers and sisters. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So getting back to Stan's point, getting back to Stan's point, why um if everything we do is you know, everything we do isn't bad and we're still salvageable. Mm -hmm. And he claims us. And why would you suppose that that metaphor of family would be important to the uh, to the Hebrew Jew, the Hebrew Christian? Should I call him the kosher Christian? No, I will I apologize. You call the Messianic Christians. So there you go. The Messianic Jews. Descendants came to help the descendants of Abraham. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you listen to the comments of people in the Israeli and mosque kind of thing going on, and the sense of family is really, really apparent. You know, I don't know them, but they are my family. That's why I'm about this. You know, so in people that have been killed, Israelis have. I, I, in the lemon tree, you hear that a lot, sure, which I've just been. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that sense of family is not just my first cousins, it extends way beyond broad and then it extends way, way back, you know, that identity. And maybe that's sort of a picture of what it means to be a child of God. Our identity is rooted in the saints that have gone before us, it's in the saints that spread out around us. And that might be something we could benefit from. You get us out of the boxes a little bit once in a while. Well, why would he use, uh, why would he drop Abraham's name in there? speak to those people in his audience he's talking to his audience right so let's make sure they know you're part of this you are part of these people that yeah yeah well isn't he i guess what i'm getting at is he this is a very expansive definition of who's in mm -hmm. you know um he's addressing people who were raised with a belief that by virtue of the family i belong to i.e the family of abraham i am saved or i am God's chosen. And here, he's basically saying everybody who comes through Christ is a descendant of Abraham. And all of a sudden, Christ becomes the critical part. And Christ considers us family. 
So the concept doesn't change, but the player kind of does, right? I, I guess the descendants of Abraham are also descendants of God, right? Correct. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. I, I, think, I like to think about like that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I love I love the references that we become adopted <clears throat> children of God, you know, adopted descendants of Abraham. Um, it, it's all somewhat metaphorical, but it all kind of ties together that it's a familial thing, you know. We're we're part of that family, and Christ refers to us as brothers and sisters, despite my shortcomings. That's amazing. Can earn it. It's offered by grace. We're granted an inheritance. How is Jesus made perfect <laughs> in suffering? That's sort of an interesting phrase. Yeah. Stan, answer that one. <laughs> what do you think? I'm just curious about that too. Actually, is, is that a is that formulaic or is that reverse I mean, engineering? Jesus as perfection, he lived without sin. He was the perfect sacrifice, mm -hmm. right? He was perfected. In what sense was he made more perfect through suffering? He was a more perfect sacrifice because he'd taken on he was taking on the sin of humanity. I don't know if that. And yet, I mean, that's a conundrum. <laughs> Suffering made him more human, but, uh, you know, his sinlessness made him the better sacrifice. So I don't, I don't know. Well, in, in my version, he does say, you know, that um, he became fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. You know, the reference of high priests, again, all very Jewish concepts, all things that they would identify with. And they're basically, you know, think of how revolutionary this must have been to the, you know, the, the former Jewish uh, Hebrew. So both the sacrifice and the means of the sacrifice, the, the means through which the sacrifice even works. Mm -hmm. yeah. It becomes the connection between us and God. Which is what the priest did, right? Sure. So, be both, though. That's kind of that must have been a mind better for those guys. It's yeah. for me, you know, really. <laughs> True, but it also it also breaks down the hierarchy of the yeah, former right. religious thought that instead of having to go through a person or an angel, which these guys were struggling with, you had a one to one. It's through Christ, who is God. In other words, the barriers are gone. The note in my study Bible says that the perfection language that's used in Hebrews is to speak of something or someone brought to its final divinely ordained condition. Here it is um, Jesus' installation in heaven as a high priest. So not necessarily referring to perfection as a lack of imperfection, but just as a, a achieving that status, maybe. Is, does most of our theology about Jesus being fully human and fully God come from Hebrews, do you think? It seems like it's pretty obvious here, and maybe not so obvious in, the, in other places. I don't know. I don't know if Paul picks up on that. Mm -hmm. Surely, but he must run throughout the New Testament, I'm assuming. But boy, it really becomes apparent here where it's maybe in snatches in other places. Other books. Yeah, <clears throat> I was also wondering along that line, what remember the the different types of atonement theories of yeah. atonement? We like what what is the Hebrews yeah. author's view of atonement? Yeah, I was wishing I could remember that book. Yeah, it is here. Right? <laughs> to go back and take it out. It was the bloody one, <laughs> right? The sacrifice. So the way. Blood. Substitutionary. Substitutionary. That must be that. Yeah. Yeah. That last sentence really jumped out at me. Speak. 
because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. And if we are to carry that out, how does that look like as humans taking on that role? You know, not suffering in the sense of, you know, dying for salvation of other people, but um, having done some reading and digging into listening to people who have been oppressed in the past and seeing how they reach out to other people and, and serve other people in ways that I don't think sometimes some of us can do. Like it's, there's a connection there. Um, in the, in the book that we're reading for the session retreat this weekend, one of the um, authors had tried to encourage some of the Navajo um, people in his congregation to become missionaries and to go out. And they're like, well, we're, we're, you know, the bottom, like we don't have education. We can't do this. But he's like, no, like, you need to, you need to take out and and go into the world and 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 you know speak the word of God in the world and I just I look at the black church and what it does it's just yeah, amazing yeah. to me I mean honestly it's just amazing to me what they have done throughout history um, and it goes unnoticed because we sit in our white corners and just I remember when <laughs> oh gosh what was it six seven eight years ago there was that shooting in a black church down south and. And I remember, uh, and it was on the news, and um, the uh, the guy said, the guy who did it said, I, I hope you can forgive me. And one of the gals who lost their mother or something said, I already have. But that like, that was heavy. Amazing. People living their faith. Is there any other final thoughts on this? Well, I had fun today. I appreciate that. <laughs> Would someone please close us in prayer? Thank you, Bonnie. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to listen carefully and be attentive to your words to our fellow Christians, your word in the Bible through mistakes. Help, help us listen and, and be in tune so that we might follow your way and become the children you want us to be. Please. Amen. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Oh. Oh, thank you.